okay, so now you're Carlos Mencia. Yeah, now I'm Carlos Mencia. <laughs> and you start doing uh, the Comedy Store, uh, LA Cabaret, and that led to more and more attention. And you actually got on, on the uh, Arsenio Hall show at one point. Yeah, I was on Arsenio, but it was not, like, what they did to me was not cool. What do you mean? What did they do? So, I get a phone call from Arsenio, or from Arsenio's people, to be on. And and by the way, I'm not, like, angry that they did this. I was, because of who I am, I was actually excited. But I've never seen a late night show that had two stand-up comedians on it, Ever. They tell me that I'm going to be on and that Chris Fonseca, who we used to call Chris Crazy Licks Fonseca, because he had cerebral, he's still alive, he has cerebral palsy. So Chris went on the same show as me, not like the same audience, but different shows, the same show as me. So not only did I have to follow a comedian on one of those shows, not only did I have to follow a Latino comedian, I had to follow a Latino comedian who has cerebral palsy <laughs> and talks like this. I'm not kidding you. And that was like, I was so, so excited to, to follow him because I was like, well, he's going to kill. He's going to get a standing ovation. A hundred percent. Can I do the same? Like, can I follow this guy? To me, it was just such a challenge that uh, I, I loved it. And it was amazing. But most people forget that th that wasn't supposed to go down that way. Like, there's not somebody canceled and they put one of us in there last minute or something. But I was enthralled by the moment. Okay. And uh, you appeared on In Living Color in 1990. I ruined that one. I messed up that line, too. I was so nervous. I was yeah. so nervous. My line was literally, is that your red uh, Pinto? And his line was supposed to be, well, mine is yellow. I forgot the red part. <laughs> so I was just watching this thing in this moment. And as I think a lot of people mistook when I was younger, and I think still do today, my um, confidence for arrogance and I understand sometimes why but my confidence in myself doesn't make me believe I'm better it doesn't take away any of the of, of, of the fears that come with any of that stuff I, I'm, I just know how to do the things that I do and I'm good at but I I was so scared so scared that I saw all these people and all this stuff and the weight of that moment kept coming to me because I realized like, I'm gonna literally walk up to the main actor, open a door and give one line while everybody's quiet. And it just got to me. And I'm lucky that I even said, but he was a professional. Cause if you watch it, I come out and go, is that your pin outside? And he goes, what? And you could see him go, hmm? <laughs> I got a gremlin. <laughs> a gremlin. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, he was ne he was always kind to me. He was always really great to me. And 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 he was amazing. But yeah, that uh, <laughs> I messed up that moment. Nobody ever knew, but that was it was scary, man. It was it was not what I was used to. Okay, but then uh, in 1994, you became the host of Local Slam on HBO. Yeah, well, but before that. I hosted Comedy Compadres. Okay. Here, it, it was a local show for KTLA. And I did a, I did 16 episodes of that, when, that I, you know, that I was the, the host of it. So being, um, being handed or being driven in the direction of the Latino thing came very quickly for me. You know, okay. and then before that, I won Star Search in Spanish as well. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. I missed that part. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Okay, but HBO is still HBO. HBO it's is It's not HBO. KTLA. No. Shout out to KTLA. I live in LA too, but I HBO gotcha. is HBO. A hundred percent. Did that change your career at that point? It did start to change my career because I was very young. Unlike most hosts don't become hosts when they're, you know, 23, 24. Mm. You know, they become hosts 
especially later when they have curiosity about the questions about, you know, and, and they also become hosts when they've amassed so much material and they're so good at doing crowd work that if you say, you know, to a, if you say to somebody that's been doing comedy for 20 years, hey, we want you to host this show, you're going to do, we're going to do 22 shows and you're going to have to do three minutes of an opening on each show. So you add that all up. That's an hour and something minutes. Can you do that? They'll be like, yeah, no problem. You know, you, you say that to a young comedian like me at the time, that was like, whoa, mm -hmm. I got to start really being creative. And, and it pushed me to be very, very creative and to write a lot. And, but it also made me go to a lot. To, I, I went to the well of the Latino looking back, maybe a little more than I should have, but I just didn't have the ability to, you know, I could write this much really good stuff. They wanted this much and I could do this without Latino, but I needed the Latino to get to that other place. And so I kind of became a Latino comedian based on th those, those shows because it pushed me to have to create and, and over and over again. All right. And then by 2000, you actually put out your first comedy album through Warner Brothers. Take a Joke America. Well, Take a Joke America was, and, and you know, I always, I have yet to understand people that get offended at comedy. Mm. I still don't, I don't, I, I can't understand them. I'm, I'm, it's not that I don't want to. I literally just don't understand how you can be upset at somebody who's trying to make you happy. Mm. Like a joke is trying to make you happy. It's trying to make you laugh. How, how can you, even if we're bad at it, even if I'm horrible at it, even if I miss the mark, that's like getting mad at somebody who's donating to St. Jude's, you know, like, what are you pissed off about? Like, you could have done, but like, wh why are you mad? I tried to make you laugh. I missed the mark. Sorry. But what, what is this anger? Where's this vitriol coming from? I, I've never understood it then. And I don't understand it now. So it, 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 it I'm always blown away by, by, by the resistance to, to, to material. And then in 2001, you did uh, two half-hour comedy specials on HBO. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one actually won a Cable Ace Award for Best Stand-Up Comedy Special. Mm -hmm. So now, I mean, an HBO comedy special in 2001 was a very big deal. It's probably the equivalent to a Netflix special today. Uh, it had lost a little bit of its luster, but it was still there. It was still up there. Correct. Did that change your career at that point? Everything changed my career, but there was never a huge... like. So in 1994, when I did my first HBO special, I'd never opened for anybody before, really, mm -hmm. or featured, right? So the majority of comics get to feature, or so they get to open and watch and feature and watch. I grew up at the Comedy Store. So I just saw and did, and saw and did 15, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, uh, every, you know, got up almost every single day, but didn't get to do all that other stuff. So by the time... 94, 95 comes around and, and that special comes out. I'm, I'm on the road. Headlining, selling out. Mm. No crappy markets. No, just selling out. And at first, I'm selling out like gangbusters because I'm doing all the markets that want me right away. Right? So those are all the Latino markets that are like, you know, hey, we got we to gotta get Carlos. So, man, the, the Southwest was just open to me, you know, come to Houston, come to Corpus, come to Laredo, come to McAllen, come to Harlingen, come, I mean, it was like, come to San Antonio, come to Austin, come to Dallas, we got to show up Fort Worth, you got to show up uh, in Odessa, Amarillo, oh, you got to do Tucson now, you got to do Las Cruces, you got to do Phoenix, man, you got to come to, oh my God, you got to, it was just like, you got to come to Chicago, Chicago's just, all of these markets opened up for me. And so I got to, I got to do that for a while. It wasn't those, those. So by the time 10 years later, these things come out, I've, I've, I've not, I've sold out this whole time. So I'm not really seeing it. It, it was, it was when I knew things were going to change was when we did the presentation for, for Comedy Central. When we did the presentation for Comedy Central, 
And they got to see basically a live version of what we wanted to do on Mind of Mencia. I saw, looking back, that my special on Comedy Central and my led to that moment. And I went, oh, that's why that was important. Yeah, that was a breakout this. for you, the Comedy Central appearance. Yes. Huge. Yes. I mean, I didn't know it ben, then, and I don't know that I've ever given it its true place in my career, mm -hmm. how relevant it was, but it was one of the most pivotal moments in my career. Okay, and then in 2005, The Mind of Mencia comes out on Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. People kind of compared it to The Chappelle Show a little bit. Here's the thing. It was not the opposite ever, because that's not what it was supposed to be. Yeah. When they picked up the show, they said, we have two great news for you. I was like, wait, what? We're going to pick up the show. What? And we want to partner you with Dave Chappelle. Okay. Wait, what? Chappelle shows the number one show on cable right now. They're like, yeah, and you're gonna follow it. Mm. We want you guys to be like the 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 black and brown punch to that hour. Okay. So I was like, like, what is an angel gonna come down from heaven and blow me now? Like, what is happening here? <laughs> this is the most amazing thing ever. This what? What? Cut to uh, about a month-ish before we're going to go to air. They go, I don't know what's happening with Chappelle, but he's not doing the show. So you can't come out with Chappelle because Chappelle's not on the network. And so if you watch the first episode of Mind of Mencia, our show is basically saying we're not Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do at the time was kind of do a little sketch where I'm in the office and they're like, you're going to be with Dave Chappelle. And then cut to me going, Dave, Dave, come on, man. I need you. You know, but they were like, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to put Dave in here. We don't really want to say anything. And so from that point on a certain amount of people especially people that don't know how productions work and how long they go from initial to actually putting an episode out people actually thought or some people anyway that when they said when when Dave Chappelle said no I don't want to do it anymore they called me up and went hey can we get you <laughs> in about a month yeah sure you can do it. And and so a lot of people saw me as a replacement. Right. But that's not true. It was never intended to be that. It was I mean, never intended to be that. Did you and Dave Chappelle have a relationship during that time? We did not. Not in that respect. Um, you know, and I wish I did because I, I wish I would have called him and said, hey, man, I just want you to know that I was supposed to be on with you and I was so excited to do that. So, you know, how would you like me to approach this from your perspective? I think that that would have gone a long way. But I was, I was all, all through those years that you're talking about, I was so overwhelmed, especially in the 2000s with creating. And my mind never turns off as a standup. So now you're adding sketches and songs and ideas and all this. I didn't have time to look around to see what was going on, to see you know, that I, that had I called him, I think that not only were, would his and I relationship be different and stronger, but I think he would have seen me because I've heard him talk about this time and how, you know, watching my show sometimes was painful to him. I think I, I could have helped it not be that for him, but I just, I didn't, I was so consumed with yeah. everything that was being asked of me. It was me. your first show. It was your first actual show about you, so yeah. And I you could had your blinders on. I, I could, and I could also tell you right now that I did. I had. I did not have the capability to 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 even enjoy it. Like when people ask me how how much fun was it, it was like I I didn't have fun. Not like that. Not like you think. Yeah. I was. Every show had to be perfect. Every show had to be great. I wasn't just Carlos Mencia. I was Carlos Mencia, the guy who went to. Uh, uh, let me see. I was Carlos Mencia, the guy who performed as a Latino for the first time and the first Latino ever to do a show 
at a comedy club in Hoover, Alabama. Hmm. Five, 10 years later, I see George Lopez went there. I see they brought others. So I know that the doors that I open sometimes stay open for those behind me. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that I had to be great at this. I knew that I couldn't, you know, suck at, at a show or else they would say, uh, Latino stuff doesn't work. Not Carlos, Latino. I mean, you being uh, on the same network as the Chappelle show and, you know, speaking to the, you know, the, the executives and so forth. Do you know why Chappelle's show ended? Because like you said, it was the hottest thing on television. One of my big regrets is that I was never able to do anything with the Chappelle show. Like, I really wish I could have been part of that. Right. You know, doing the boondocks was like, okay, at least I got that. But right. Chappelle's show was my number one choice. Right. But I wasn't even in the industry back then. But right. why did it end? Because it was on such a crazy momentum. I remember even interviewing uh, Charlie Murphy and Eddie Murphy had agreed to do the next season to do... Charlie Murphy's True Hollywood Stories. Eddie was going to be in it. Right. So, so the anticipation was insane, and then Dave just walked away from it all. Right. But he walked away, as he said it, because when you are, okay, like, like the bit about let's teach, uh, let's teach gangbangers how to do drive-bys, right? Let's take that sketch. Mm -hmm. um, it's very specific to gangbangers, but a lot of people would see that bit and laugh at us, not with us, Okay, right? So when you're a minority and you venture to do anything self-deprecating or say words that are edgy and out there, and then people come up to you and tell you, that was funny when you said this, but they're taking the racial component and flipping it. That's, that's disconcerting. And the fact that he didn't want to deal with that, I understand. I've heard the same words that he has hmm. in the sense that I grew up around, around every group and some brothers, you know, black. And when I was a kid, they would refer to me, my black friends, as a right? That's how they would talk to me. What are we doing today? Something, you know, that kind of thing. And so every once in a while, I'll do it in my act. But there was a period of time where I kind of put a bit together about all that kind of stuff. And I remember people coming up to me, especially people with accents. And not that they had anything, it's just the way it sounded. But when somebody comes up to you and goes, listen, man, I fucking think you're amazing because that's that shit, it was real. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. What did you, no, no, I did not say what you said. The word that I said was completely different. It meant something different. It wasn't even close to what you were trying to say. Like, you seriously thought that that's where I was going with this? Um, and so for his show to be taken that way mm -hmm. and for him to go, oh, wait, I thought I was, I thought you were laughing at my intelligence, at how I write a joke. You're basically laughing because I'm cooning out for you. I'm stepping fetching it for you. I'm Amos and Andy in it for you. Mm. That, that, I mean, I, I would have quit the show. I've stopped doing certain bits because of it. So if you want to say I've quit shows, but I would quit a show if I felt the way he did. And that, when that, when that becomes, I mean, I can't even imagine. Could you imagine being black and somebody saying, I love your jokes? Like, Fuck, that, that's, I mean, that's just, I, I, I don't have words to describe what that could even feel like. And for him to get that, not once, not twice, but over and over. And then on the other side, to, to have people say, you know, you should, you should be dead because of the stuff that you say. Mm. That I've had. And, and that's, that's jarring, man. Yeah. We're comedians. What are you talking about? I just created a stupid bit about teaching people gangbangers how to shoot and drive at the same time in a car that has hydraulics like come on seriously <laughs> you you, you want to take it to a place of death now yeah wow um it's jarring man it's jarring what people push us to as comedians